You want to open your Bibles to uh, 1 Samuel, the 13th chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 13 is where our lesson will come from tonight. It's good to see all of you here. We do have uh, quite a few visitors with us here tonight. We appreciate you being here and, uh, of course, welcome you back at uh, any time you may have the, the opportunity to be here. Appreciate the parents getting your children here tonight. We had quite a few on the front row. Um, it's always fun to sing with them. It's really entertaining to let them answer questions. It's kind of frightening at times. You never know what they're going to say, <laughs> but, but it's, uh, it's, it's always a good time, and, and we definitely enjoy that. And we, we appreciate uh, your part that you play in that and, and getting those little ones here, and let's, let's definitely continue to, to keep that up. Uh, we started a series of lessons this past week that we entitled uh, Having Zeal uh, for the Lord's House. And, and we base that off of David's words back in Psalm where he talked about that zeal for the Lord's house had eaten him up. And, and we talked about where that came from and, and, and what really was driving that in David. And then we jumped forward and, and we looked at how that was reflected in, in the life of Christ when he went through and, and he cleaned out the temple and he, he turned over the, the money changers tables and drove them out with a whip. They remembered that it had been said, zeal for your house has eaten me up. And that's kind of the, the theme of our series moving forward. And we talked about last week of that great zeal that David had, and we really kind of turned that around ourselves to say, is our zeal what it needs to be? But as we look a little bit deeper into this subject and as we start moving on into this, I said we would look at David's zeal first, but really, where did that zeal come from? I mean, you can be excited about something, but in order to remain excited, you've got to have the heart. We, we, we talk about that a lot. I, I really try to hammer that into my kids, especially on the ball field, that, you know, if, if you're going to play day in and day out, if you're going to play good, then you've got to have that heart. When you come into worship, especially here, if you're going to do good in church, if you're going to do good in worship, you don't just go through the motions, you've got to have the heart. So it's one thing to look at David's zeal. It's another thing to look at what kept that zeal going, and that's his heart. And the way that David was brought onto the scene really is, it starts in 1 Samuel 13 is, is where his story starts. It didn't take long for, for King Saul to be, uh, to be rejected. Uh, 1 Samuel 13 there, and in verse 1 it talks about when he had reigned one year and then he reigned two years, he basically blew it in his second year. Now, he reigned about 40 years, but he messed it up in year two. <laughs> that just shows you kind of what kind of kingship he had. But he goes in there, and, and he, he gets intimidated by the Philistines, he gets intimidated by what's going on, and he oversteps his bounds and makes an unlawful sacrifice. And he greets Samuel as if nothing was wrong. But I want you to notice what is being said here in 1 Samuel 13, in particularly in verse 14. It says there to Saul, Now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord has commanded you. So what's he saying there? In a simple way, what he's saying is, Saul, God gave you everything that you needed. And he even goes on and talks about, in, in the context of his conversations with him, he says, you know, when you were little in your own eyes, you were, you were good to go. When you felt like God shouldn't have chosen you, when you were humble, you were the king you needed to be. But when you stepped out of your shoes and stepped into somebody else's, namely Samuel's, and started acting as if you're in the part of somebody you're not, you have forgotten the heart that you maybe once had. I don't know that King Saul ever really had the heart that he needed. That's probably debatable. I really highly doubt that he ever did. But one man for sure did. And that man was David. We often refer to David as a man after God's own heart. And we find that ultimately from 1 Samuel 13 where we just read here. But I'll tell you something, I've always struggled with that. And even after studying these lessons as this one, sometimes I still struggle with that. Why David? He's, he's fed up with Saul and that didn't take long. So he's got to choose somebody better. He's got to choose somebody after his own heart. But why did he pick David? When you, when you go back and you study the history of David's life, and when you look at the mistakes that he made, when you look at how sometimes he was completely out of place in his life, and ultimately the sin he committed with Bathsheba, and then how he tried to cover it up by, by getting Uriah to come back home to her, and that didn't work, so he put him in the forefront of the battle, and essentially 
he, murders, he murdered an innocent man and took his wife from him. How, how in the world could that be a man after God's own heart? Surely, surely a man after God's own heart wouldn't do something so foolish and so sinful and so evil. So why David? Why, why was David referred to as the son or really, rather the father of Christ? So many times throughout the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as the son of David. Now there's a few references where he's referred to as the son of Abraham, but more so often than not, he's referred to as the son of David. Why was Jesus called the son of David? Why? why? Why not somebody else? What was so special about David? How could such an imperfect person be a man after God's own heart? Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about God's chosen one. But I want us to focus on why he was the chosen one. Because in this series of lessons that we're going through, talking about having zeal for the Lord's house, okay? In order to be able to do that, we're going to have to make sure that our heart is right first. And we're going to have to have a heart. If our zeal for God's house is going to be what it needs to be, then we've got to make sure that our heart is right to begin with because it takes heart to be the servant we need to be. And David was that servant. No, that did not mean he was perfect. But it did mean, and it does mean even still today, that it had the right qualities to be found in his heart and the same have to be found in ours as well. We're going to look at four very simple points tonight. And I hope it will be something that will encourage us to get our hearts in a better position to where we too can have zeal for the Lord's house to the greater degree that David had. I think it goes without saying, if you're going to be that type of servant that, that God says has a heart that is very similar to mine, a, a man after God's own heart, the first thing you really have to talk about is conviction. In other words, how devoted are you to the cause and how devoted are you to making sure that God has his glory. You know, when you think about it, David, unlike Saul, we, we've, we've looked at two essentially completely different people that held, at, at some point in their life, held the same position, right? They both served as king of Israel. Two totally different people. But David, unlike Saul, felt and lived that he had been chosen for a reason. I don't know that, that Saul ever really... I guess, grasp the whole idea. Maybe in the very beginning, he was kind of taken back a little bit by why he was chosen. When he was little in his own eyes, but it didn't take long for him to become big in his own eyes, and then he forgot how important of a position he held. We're going to have to have a strong conviction if we're going to be the person that God is looking for to have the heart to be his servant. And that all starts with this zeal that we've been talking about. Notice David's zeal. Psalm 40 and verse 8. I delight to do your will. That's what makes me happy. That's what brings me joy. He says, oh my God, and your law is within my heart. He says, you are my God, and your will is what I want to do. That's what makes me happy, and your law is what's in my heart. Ultimately, that's why he's a man after God's own heart. What about us? Do we have that type of, of strong conviction in our lives? Are we, a, are we a do it God's way type of person and happy to do it that way? Or do we try to bend the rules and try to, try to maneuver around things to make it fit us? That's what happens a lot in the religious realms today. And ultimately, that's, that's, what, that's what Saul did. When you go back to, to 1 Samuel chapter 15, here's another case very shortly thereafter, the, the account we just read. He's, he's going up against the Amalekites, he's going up against. against uh, the king Agag, and God said, I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites and I want you to destroy everything about it. Well, he spared the king and he spared the choice livestock. And he comes back and, and, and basically it's been told to Samuel that Saul is setting up monuments for himself. He's not bringing, or nor is he concerned with bringing God glory, but he's setting up monuments for himself and he's just going completely off base from what he's supposed to be doing. Again, he's got a lot of heart, but it's not for God, it's for Saul. So Samuel draws near to Saul in 1 Samuel 15. And Saul, as if nothing has ever happened, he comes there and he says, Samuel, I have performed the commandment of God. He knew good and well he had not done that, but that's how he presented himself. And Samuel said, really? Well, what is this bleeding I hear of these sheep? And what is this lowing of the oxen that I hear? It doesn't sound like to me like you've done what God wanted you to. It doesn't sound like to me like you sought to glorify God. It sounds like you're glorifying yourself. That's ultimately what he said to him. 
And we have to ask ourselves that, what, what is our driving force in this life? Is it everything that we want? Is it everything that, that, that we want to accomplish in our lives? Or is it first and foremost being devoted to God and bringing God glory? What matters the most to us? I think about Paul and his life. One of the strongest convictions that we'll ever see in, in the New Testament, reading about all these people that serve God, time was closing in on him. And, and more and more people were becoming perturbed at Paul and, and angry at Paul, hating Paul. And word got out that, Paul, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. And, and his brethren and, and those that are with him are trying to not get him to go to Jerusalem. And he's tore up about that. He says, you're breaking my heart. For I'm not only ready to be bound, but I'm ready to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And you're standing in my way. That's a man that's convicted. That's a man that is devoted to glorifying God. He was not thinking at all about himself. What about our conviction? What about our devotion to God? Can we be surprised, or be, I guess, described rather as a person after God's own heart? Part of that has to do with how convicted we are to serving God. Jesus lived his life never seeking his own glory. John chapter 8, verse 49 and 50. What about us? What about us? The point is very simple. Once we pick up that cross, it's not about us anymore. It's about Jesus. Jesus says, he who takes, doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of it. We talk a lot about the cross. We talk a lot about being a Christian. We talk a lot about having a form of godliness like we talked about this morning. But are we really bearing that cross? And are we really trying to tote our part of the load? Is our life all about Jesus? Or is it mostly about us and some about Him? It should be like the song that we sing, None of me and all of Him. That's what it means to be a man after God's own heart. Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 14, Paul said, God forbid that I would boast except in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what has to lead our life as well. Secondly, we've got to be dependent upon God's guidance. Saul, when you go back to King Saul, and again, we're contrasting these two completely different kings, and yet we're focusing on David, who was a man after God's own heart, and why God chose him. Saul was proud of his strengths, and he loved to sort of put them in the forefront where everybody could see him. That's why he's building monuments for himself. That's why he's going around saying, look at me, I stand... Head and shoulders above everybody else. The Bible even tells us that. And he acted like it. That was his problem. He was proud of that. On the other hand, David, it's at times he was guilty of that. There was a time in David's life where he uh, caused this unlawful census to be sent out. And rather than trusting in God, he's trying to trust in his numbers. And God rebuked him for that. He, he struggled with that like any king would. But for the most part, David in his life was just as was mentioned in Psalms 18, verses 1 through 3. David said, You, O Lord, are my strength. You're my rock. You're my fortress. You're my deliverer. You're my shield. You're the horn of my salvation. You're my stronghold. You're everything that I need you to be. And that's who David was. David re believed that because with his bare hands, he's killed a lion. He's killed a bear. He's killed a Philistine. Giant that... After 40 days, nobody in Israel done anything about him. And David walks up on the scene and says, who's this guy? Remember, we talked about that last week. Who's this guy? Why, why is he talking against us that way and against God's people that way and against God that way? Who's going to do something about that? David had that fire in him, but that fire was not about himself. It was in relying on God and knowing that God was going to win the battle because the battle is the Lord's to begin with. You see, when your battle's are really the Lord's and not yours alone, you understand that you can have that confidence. And you can have that devotion. And you can have that conviction because you're relying not on your own accord, but you're relying on God's. And that's what we have to do. But David, in his life, depended fully upon God. What about your sufficiency? When you think about all the things that you're able to do, to whom do you credit that ability? One of my favorite stories in the New Testament is where Peter and John had gone in and they had healed this lame man. And they get, they get a lot of attention. Obviously, you would. This guy's been lame for quite some time. Everybody knew who he was. All of a sudden, he's healed. And you start looking at the guys that did that and thinking, 
these guys have got something going on. And a lot of people would run with that, just like Simon the sorcerer did for years. A lot of people would run with that and say, yeah, look at me. But they didn't. And Peter and, Peter and John looked at them and said, hold on a minute. Why are, you, why are you marveling at us? And we read this in Acts chapter 3 and verse 12 and 13. He says, why are you looking so intently at us as though we had done some great thing? As if though by our own power we had caused this guy to walk. The God of Abraham and Isaac and the God of Jacob and the God of our fathers. That's the man, he says. And he finally concludes his statement in verse 16. He says it's through his name and through faith in his name that this guy was made strong. Peter said, don't look at us like we're anything special. Yeah, we had a part in this, but God's power is the one that made it go through. David lived his life that way too. He didn't take the credit for himself. He was a guy that leaned on God and said, He's my rock, fortress, deliverer, strength, and shield. He is the God of battles. And he's the one that gives the victory. I think David, if, if anybody had asked, if they walked up to David and said, David, how'd you kill the giant? He probably would have said, well, I picked the rock up, and I put it in the sling, but God made the rock. And I, I made my hand go around, but God made me release it at the right thing, and, and he probably sped it up just a little bit. God did it. I don't know how he would describe it, but I guarantee he would have said, God killed Goliath, not me. He was dependent upon God's guidance. What about us? When we look at ourselves, do we see that we're sufficient of ourselves as to think of anything being from ourselves? I hope we don't. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have self-confidence, but for whatever measure of self-confidence we have, it has to be because God is in us. That's a man after God's own heart. That's the person that can truly be eat up with zeal for the Lord's house because you rely on God to do God's work. God didn't create us. He didn't design us to tread out the grain and to bear the fruit without His help. We have to have His help. And we need that. And in fact, Jesus said in John 15, unless you abide in me, you won't bear any fruit, for I'm the true vine. Are you dependent upon the grace of God and upon His guidance? David was. And that's why he was David's chosen person. What about us? Here's another big difference between Saul and David. Saul was a man who always had an excuse for what he did. You know, I think we all have probably seen that before. We might be guilty of it ourselves. We've always got a good reason for why we've done or have not done something. There's always an excuse. But you know, a man after God's own heart, and I go back to this. I asked the question at the beginning of the lesson, why David? He did those things with Bathsheba. He did awful things in his life. Why David? How, how could somebody that would, would do something like that, how could they be a man after God's own heart? Never said that he had to be perfect. But how we deal with sin once it is brought to our attention has a lot to do with what type of servant we really are. None of us are perfect. But when Saul was brought to his attention that, Saul, you messed up. You shouldn't have done this. Why have you done this? This is not your place. You've overstepped your bounds. What did he say in 1 Samuel 13, 11, and 12? He said, well, I felt all this pressure, and I felt the Philistines, and I waited at the given time, and Samuel's not here. He said, I felt compelled to do this. In other words, he said, I did what I had to do. I had good reason to do it. Well, it doesn't matter if we have good reason or not. If it's not God's will, it doesn't matter what kind of reason we have in our mind. So the difference in somebody who is a man after God's own heart and somebody who is not a man after God's own heart, as you've got Saul making excuses for his wrong, what did David do? When Nathan finally looked at him and said, David, you are the man, what did David say? Did he offer any excuses? Did he say, well, your eyes should have been home with her? Did he say, well, it was an accident that I saw her? Did it say, well, God made me this way and I have these natural desires? He didn't say any of that, did he? What did he say? He said, I have sinned. I have sinned. David wasn't perfect. But I firmly believe that God chose David because David was willing to admit when he messed up. God can use somebody like that. God can use somebody that is not perfect but is willing to admit that they're not perfect so that they would rely on God so that he can make them perfect. That's the difference. Are we willing to admit where we're wrong?
David, unlike Saul, sincerely repented when he messed up. What about us? The truth is, we all mess up. But the difference is how we react. When our sins are brought forth, when things are brought to our attention, how we react really says if we're after God's own heart or not. Every sincere Christian is going to fall short. But the ones that are doing what God wants them to do will take that, admit the wrong, and not use it as an excuse to go the other way, but will correct that. By the mercy and the grace of God, they will correct that, and they will continue serving God. You know, David, after that, didn't throw up his hands and say, well, I'm not fit to be king anymore. I don't want to be the God's chosen anymore. I quit. He never said that. He just moved forward with better intent. That's a man after God's own heart. Not perfect, but willing to admit he's wrong and do better moving forward. What about us? David said even of that own accord, in that, in that same story, he said at a psalm, Psalm 51, having to do the same event, wash me thoroughly, cleanse me from my sin, I acknowledge my transgression. Do we do that? Can we acknowledge those transgressions? Do we, do we show that, that Corinthian repentance in our lives where we have sought in every way to clear ourselves and to be pure in God's sight? If we are striving to do better, not just to say I'm sorry, but to strive to do better, God sees that in us and He can use that. But until we admit the faults in our life, we'll never be the servant of God that He needs us to be. That's the difference in David and in Saul. And that's why he chose David and rejected Saul. Saul couldn't get out of his own way. But David said, I've sinned. How do we react? How do we react? And fourthly and lastly, David had a sympathy for God's people. David was a king, but you know, he didn't really act like a king. For the most part, he didn't set himself on a high horse. He identified himself with the people. Really, before he was king, he was already doing that. It wasn't his problem that Goliath was threatening God's people, but he took it as his own. He didn't, have to, he didn't have to make that covenant with Jonathan to be best friends, and he especially didn't have to honor it after Jonathan was gone with his son Mephibosheth. I mean, he was a cripple. Who cares? I mean, why would he do that? He did that because he was a man after his own word. <laughs> And he loved Jonathan, and he loved Mephibosheth, and he saw the worth in Mephibosheth. He didn't just say, ah, oh, he's not worth it. That had nothing to do with it. He saw a man who was valuable in God's sight, he was valuable in David's sight, and he loved him. A man after God's own heart, a person after God's own heart, loves other people. They're not selfish. And I've always been amazed about David. Probably the most amazing thing about David is that, he, that Saul sought to kill him so many times. And on two different occasions, David was in reaching distance of Saul and could have ended it all. Could have killed him. But he didn't. And he kind of antagonized him a little bit and he even felt guilty about doing that. That's a man after God's own heart. Do we live that kind of life? What about when somebody comes out and says bad about us and maybe even curses us like Shimei did David? Do we want to rise up like David was encouraged to do and just cut them down? Or do we take it and say, perhaps the Lord will bless us this day because of this cursing? I've never been, I've never been so amazed at, 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 a, at a account of somebody's life where they took ridicule and said, well, maybe good's going to come from it. David had sympathy. Because he realized that he too was a sinner. Again, he acknowledged his transgressions. And his sins were always before him. And he accepted that. And he sought to do better. Paul did likewise. Where Paul said, I've, I'm a chief of sinners. And we need to understand, as, as John said, that, that we, we all sin. If we say we have no sin, we, we lie and the truth isn't in us. And we need to take heed. We talked about this just the other night in class that just as soon as we think that we stand, we should take heed lest we fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Because that pride goeth before destruction. No wonder Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. David was a man after God's own heart because he loved people. Even when people really didn't deserve to be loved, like Saul, he loved them anyway. What about us? What about us? So to summarize what we talked about tonight, and we'll wrap the lesson up with this. A man after God's own heart, sure. But why David? 
Well, because he had a strong conviction. And he was devoted not to his glory, but to God's glory. Number one, we've got to be devoted to God's glory if we're going to be the servant we need to be. Secondly, we're going to have to be dependent upon God's guidance and readily admit that because we can't do it of our own accord. Thirdly, we've got to be willing to show humility when we're wrong. Even the best leaders fall short. And we need to be able to admit that. And perhaps that's the best of the best leaders, those who admit they're wrong and strive to do better. And we see that in David. And finally, we just got to love. How, how else would a man after God's own heart be than to be love and to love others? For God is love. Do we show that kind of mercy that David showed to other people? We could probably talk about many other things, but that's a pretty good summary of what it means to be a man after God's own heart. But the question is tonight, a man after God's own heart is full of zeal for the house of God. The question is, how closely do we match that? What about our zeal? What about our dedication? Are we really a person after God's own heart? Do we have that zeal for God's house the way we need to? I hope we do. But if we don't, let's make sure that we have it. And let's make the necessary changes so that we can be those servants, that, that zealous, on fire, ready to go, get after it, servant of God. The church needs more people like that today. Will that be you? Will that be me? There's some changes you need to make in your life tonight. We hope that you'll make them. You need to become a child of God. What a perfect time to do so. If you need to be restored tonight, through the prayers of your brethren, we're here to help you in any way. We can help you. Won't you come while we stand and while we sing?